Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. We, um, we're trying something a little different now and trying to get worship started by 1030 every Sunday morning. So we, uh, we did the prelude a little bit earlier and I'm doing announcements a little bit earlier. So sorry to surprise you with that. But um, we, we normally have had some pretty full Sundays. So we felt like it'd be good to, to get started right at 1030. So we're glad you're here. Welcome to First Baptist Church, Gatlinburg. And whether you're visiting with us um, in person or online or, or wherever you are, we're, we're glad you're with us. So um, we're thankful for you. Um, I would like to also remind you to turn these off or turn them on to vibrate. Um, that way we're not um, disturbing everybody around us when they ring. Um, all your announcements are on the bulletin that, that at least I know of, but I did want to call attention to a couple of them. Uh, Miss Linda Kay wanted me to, to um, reach out to you to let you know that this month is September. The month of September is Tennessee State Offering Month, and we are taking up offering um, in these little gold envelopes, or you can just designate it on your, on your check or, or whatever you would like to do. The other thing I'd like to emphasize is that September 23rd is our food ministry picnic that we do every year down at the uh, food ministry in Sevierville. And um, this is a great event where we feed folks that are coming in to, to get food. And uh, we need some volunteers, we need some food and water donations. And there is a sign up sheet on the uh, bulletin boards as you walk downstairs into the fellowship hall. So uh, I believe that's the biggest things. One other thing I did want to emphasize, if you, if you own a business or run a business, you know now is not the greatest time to hire somebody. Um, but we really need a custodian and we really need a nursery worker. So if you happen to know someone that's looking for a job, um, please send them our way. So um, the, uh, the next thing I want to announce is the um, prayer list. We have prayer list in the back. If you didn't pick one up, please do so on your way out. Um, I want to um, at least call to your attention a couple of things. One is not on there. Um, Miss Megan Owenby lost her mother this um, yesterday, actually, um, Rita Gerard. So they're going to have a service on Monday. Um, not quite sure of the time yet, but it, it will be on Monday and here in this church. Um, and as, as we mentioned last week, just the continued strife and, and messed up world that we have in Afghanistan and, and uh, continue to see the death toll rise from Hurricane Ida and uh, just all the things that are going on. Our COVID numbers are increasing. We've had more deaths um, even in our county. We, it's just a, it's a tough time. So um, I think it's a great time to come together in corporate prayer to pray for, pray for our country, pray for our church and uh, pray for this time together. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we, um, we thank you for your presence in this room today. We, we thank you for your presence and walking through the tough times of life. And uh, we, we need you right now, and, and we call upon your name. We, uh, we're thankful for the many blessings that you share with us. We're, we're thankful for this time to gather. We, and, and I pray that you would just uh, make this time um, a worshipful time. And, and everything said, sung, and, and heard here today glorifies you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Six hundred and sixty three. O church, arise, put your armor on. O church, arise and put your armor on. Hear this call of Christ our captain. For now the weak can say that they are strong In the strength that God has given With shield of faith and belt of truth We'll stand against the devil's lies An army bold whose battle cry is love Reaching out to those in darkness Oh 
our call to war, to love the captive soul, but to rage against the captor. And with the sword that makes the wounded whole, we will fight with faith and valor, with feast with trials on every side. We know the outcome is secure, and Christ will have the price for which he died, an inheritance of nations. Come see the cross where love and mercy meet as the Son of God is stricken. Then see his foes lie crushed beneath his feet for the conqueror has risen. And as the stone is rolled away and Christ emerges from the grave, this victory march continues till the day Every eye and heart shall see him. So spirit come, put strength in every stride. Give grace to every hurdle, that we may run with faith to win the prize of a servant good and faithful. As saints of old still line the way, retelling triumphs of His grace. We hear the calls and hunger for the day when with Christ we stand in glory. time for Kayla, and I look nothing like Kayla, uh, but I do want to take some time before she gives her testimony and read scripture to do something a little different. Uh, we have an exciting announcement uh, for the church body this morning. Uh, Brian mentioned that we have some uh, employment openings for a custodian and a nursery worker, uh, but when I came here a few weeks ago, one of the ones that stood out to me really clearly was also the need for someone to give their sole focus to our children's ministry. Uh, Taylor Caldwell has done a great job with that, uh, but Taylor will tell you he's a slash guy. He's a, a education slash senior adult slash children slash whatever else needs to be done. And that's great to have a guy like that, by the way, and we really appreciate all that he does. But for something like children's ministry, especially with new families coming, we wanted to have someone who could give their sole focus uh, to that ministry. And as the Lord does often, he was already working. And he was already moving in someone's life. And I, I don't need to give any introduction to this family, uh, Kayla and AJ. Uh, if you guys would come and bring your kids. Uh, God had already been speaking uh, to, uh, to them about possibly uh, a new season of ministry in their lives and what that would look like. And as we began to reach out to them and, and talk about the needs here at First Baptist, the, the pieces just fit together perfectly and the timing was just right for Kayla and AJ to bring their kids and, and for Kayla to focus as our new director of children's ministry. And so I know you're excited and, and you guys can, amen. Oh, no problem, no problem. Not sure she should be a leading minister she don't have her children. Amen, amen. <laughs> And so I just wanted to have a time of prayer and commissioning over them. I know they need no further introduction to you. You guys know and love them. And just pray that God would use them in this next season of their ministry uh, to impact the next generation of making disciples here at First Baptist. So let me pray over them, and Kayla's going to go and, and read the scripture. Father, we thank you so much for your goodness to us as a church. Lord, you have been faithful to this church for so many years and bringing faithful servants to serve in all these different ministries. And Lord, we know that through those ministries, you have raised up faithful believers and sent them out. And Kayla and AJ are good examples of that as they were raised up in this church and sent out and have been serving in other areas. And, and now, Lord, you're, you're taking that investment that many in this congregation have made and you're bringing it back full circle uh, to this congregation to be able to serve the next generation and to make disciples here at First Baptist Gatlinburg. 
Lord, we pray uh, for your hand of guidance on them and your blessing on this ministry. Lord, we pray that you would bring many families with young children to be a part of this church so that Kayla and AJ can pour into their lives and, and the volunteers that they recruit and train would be able to make disciples of these young children and, and see them baptized and see them brought into the, the life of this church and discipled and made followers and, and warriors for your kingdom, even as we've just sung. So Lord, we pray your blessing on this new season of ministry for them, and we pray that you would use it for your glory and your kingdom's sake. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, guys. One, if you have your Bibles, please turn. Um, and if you don't have your Bibles, there are Bibles in front of you in the pews. Um, so if you will, go ahead and grab one of those. And we're going to be reading today from 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 through 10. So it's 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 through 10. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you, God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word has no place in our lives. I know many faces in this room and there's a few new ones. Um, Like Pastor Nick just said, I'm Kayla. Um, I grew up in this church. I um, was dedicated as a baby in this church. I got saved in this church. I got married in this church, (laughs) and actually our um, oldest, Thomas, was dedicated as well. So this building holds a lot um, of memories, great memories for my family. Um, I've always grew up in church, obviously, Um, and I remember the day that the Lord started tugging on my heart. Um, I remember I was so excited to um, come before everyone and um, say, hey, I invited Jesus in my life. I want to be, I, I be saved. I want to be baptized. And um, I remember the outfit I was wearing. It was pink. And I remember I didn't tell my Nana because I wanted it to be a surprise. And it was an Easter Sunday. I don't know if you remember that or not. But um, I came down. And um, I always have had a love for the Lord. Um, he's always been so good and so faithful to me. Um, And I remember it really hit me when I was in high school that God loved me. But more than that, more than his love for me, he wanted a relationship with me. No matter what my past looked like, no matter how far gone I felt I was, he actually wanted me. He wanted a relationship with me. And I remember I was on a mission trip. It was my junior year of high school. And it just really hit me. And that's actually when I felt God's call on my life. Um, and I'll be honest, I kind of ignored it, um, the call in my life. But I remember um, that junior year, I completely, my mind, the Lord completely changed my mind into who he was. And that um, he wanted to walk with me every day. And that's what he wants for all of us. Now fast forward. Um, we came from Connect Church um, from Sevierville. And I served in children's ministry for about a year. And then I got asked to come on staff. And um, it was then that I really felt like I was actually stepping in to what God has called called me to do. Um, You know, and I look back and I'm like, oh, why didn't I do that sooner? But I'm stubborn. And that's just sometimes we we don't listen to the Lord. But I'm thankful that I finally did. Um, And so I'm so thankful for this opportunity to um, just love on all of your kids. I think children are blessings. And... um, my whole heart is for kids just to be the light, to shine bright um, for Christ in schools. Um, and also to know that not only does God love them, but God wants a relationship with them. And he wants to walk hand in hand with them. And on good days and bad days, because you're going to have storms of life, that he's always there. And he always makes a way. And so, um, like I said, I'm just really excited um, to be here. And I'm thankful that... I, for one, once in my life, um, decided to listen 
to the good Lord because his plans are way better than my plans. And, um, yeah, so that's just a little bit about me. And now I invite um, your children ages kindergarten through second grade. We have children's church downstairs and younger. Um, There's another class, so I can take any younger ones with me now. So, yeah. Would you join me in in singing hymn number 232? We'll sing all four stanzas, The Power of the Cross. Would you stand with me? on the road to Calvary tried by sinful men torn and beaten then nailed to the cross of wood it's the power of the cross Christ
you choir. If you have a Bible, I invite you to take it out and join me in the book of 1 John. 1 John chapter 1, as we continue our series in the book of 1 John, that we're calling A Kingdom of Love and Light. It's a line from an old hymn that many of you know, and God's great kingdom will come on earth, a kingdom of love and light. I, if I were guessing, I would think they probably took that idea from the book of 1 John, because in this book, what he's been describing is the fact that we have a God who has not left the world in darkness, even though we all are in sin and we all are in darkness by birth, he spoke and he acted and he came into this world and he brought his love and his light to pour into each of us so that we might become a kingdom of priests to be love and light to others. So that's what we're looking at this morning in 1 John chapter 1. We're going to pick up in verse 5 and study on down to the first part of chapter 2. I just want to look at one, in, one little part of this that Kayla's already read and then we'll pray together. Beginning in verse 8, he says this, If we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you for the truths that we've heard this morning read and the truths that we've sung even with our own voices and we've heard the choir sing that you have come in the Lamb of God to take away the sins of the world. That Jesus left his throne in heaven and he came to this earth taking the form of a servant and became obedient even to the point of death so that if we would trust in him, and we would hope in his promises that we could have new life even now. So God, we pray for your light to flood in. Lord, for your love to invade our hearts and our lives this morning so that we might be the glory of God on the earth as you've called us to be, your church. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, many of you are aware that it is Memorial or Labor Day weekend, and on Labor Day weekend, there is something that you can be guaranteed to find at my house, and that will be some big piece of meat over a fire somewhere. And so I've already got my plans in the works for what that's going to look like. And then in in about a month or so, it's going to be deer season, and around that time, you're going to be guaranteed, hopefully, if the Lord blesses us, with a cooler full of meat uh, that we can put over a fire eventually and enjoy and if you come to my house at any given time you will see trophies and you'll see leather products and things from my hunting that I was able to do and and you would you would be shocked to learn from all of this that one of my children despite all of my teaching otherwise has become an animal rights activist She may have a future with PETA, I don't know. But my 11-year-old Sophia, during her time in Africa, became a lover of all living things and all creatures, and she's defensive of all living things and all creatures. And any time I went hunting, she just gave me that shaking my head and judgment kind of look. Uh, Although, I will say it didn't keep keep her from eating any of the spoils. Uh, She she didn't uh, learn to appreciate that at least, so I think we're on the right track. But one of the things she can't quite wrap her mind around is anytime we saw animals in Africa that had to be treated uh, by a veterinarian, and even here, as we've uh, learned a lot about the bear population and the way that people have to control the bear population, is why would you have to dart them? Why would you have to shoot them with a a dart gun to tranquilize? Or or why would you have to put them in some kind of snare or some kind of trap? Uh, Why would you have to put them in some kind of shackles or some kind of restraints? And as much as I tried to explain to her that I haven't really met any bears or other wild animals that are open to reason, uh, she still can't quite get the idea that animals don't cooperate even if they know that the people are, or if we can, we can try to convince them that we are working for their good. 
They've got some sort of sickness that needs to be healed or they've got some sort of disability that needs to be helped or they've got some kind of danger that they need to be moved from one area to another. We are working for their good. We're working for their ultimate joy. But they're not going to cooperate with that because they are animals. I don't think it's any accident that the scripture actually compares us as sinners that if we continue on in a path of our sin and our rebellion against God we are often compared to unreasoning beasts because here's what I think John is saying God has been working for our good God has had our good in his intention from the beginning God wants what is best for us and he wants our joy But in our sin and in our rebellion against God, what we often do is act like unreasoning beasts. We actually run from his help. We run from his goodness and we run from his correction because we think that he is out to harm us. As we turn here this morning, I think what John wants to remind us of and point our attention to is the fact that even when God is seeking to help us, as we read last week, that that he has spoken and he has sent his word into the world, the word became flesh, and that, that flesh has, that word has made himself available to all of us, our tendency, just like he says in the Gospel of John, is to run back to the, the darkness. The light has come into the world, but the, the, the world did not receive him. The light has shone into the darkness, but men love the darkness instead of the light. And John's going to tell us a few ways that we tend to run back into the darkness, even though the light is shining. And I think his main point is this, and here's our big idea for the passage today, is that we sinners tend to flee from the light because it exposes our sin. But it is only by running toward the light that we can be cleansed. Let me read that again. We sinners tend to flee from the light because it exposes our sin. But it is only by running toward the light that we can be cleansed. So John moves to this passage here and he begins to show us some of the ways that we flee from the light. And one of the things he first of all points out is a universal standard of sin that we reject. A universal standard of sin. Look what he says in verse 5. He says, This is the message we have heard from him and we declare to you that God is light and there is absolutely no darkness in him. So John begins this letter here by by addressing a a very familiar topic. If you'd read John's gospel before you heard this letter, you would be very familiar with this idea of light and darkness. But it wasn't just the gospel readers who would have heard this. It was also those who had heard the book of Genesis. After all, in the creation account we talked about last week, there was nothing, and it says that God created all all things he created the heavens and the earth and darkness was over the surface of the deep and then God spoke and what did God say let there be light so even from the beginning John knows that God is a God who brings light into the darkness his word that he speaks is a word of light bringing now this idea of light and dark is very familiar to a lot of world religions. Uh, Buddhism has this idea of yin and yang. Uh, dualism has the, the, the light and the dark, good and evil. Uh, Star Wars has Darth Vader and Yoda, right? So this idea of the good and the bad, the light and the dark. A very common concept in religious language, but the difference here with John is that John is a monotheist. He, he worships one God. And so what John is saying here is that it's not as though there are two different sides where there are some gods who are dark and some gods who are light. John's saying there is one God. He's the creator and he is a God of light. In in other words, he means everything to live in his light. What did he say in the beginning? He created all things in the first day, second day, third day, fourth day, fifth day, sixth day and said it is good. When he created mankind, he said it is very good. God meant all of his creatures to live in light. 
But it's only those of us who are sinners who have decided that we would prefer to to go another route. We would prefer to live another way. So John's concept of darkness and light here is not two opposing forces, but what he says here is that there is one reality who is God and he is light, and in him there is absolutely no darkness. Now, since 1879, when the light bulb was invented, we, in our culture, find it very difficult to experience true darkness. But if you've ever been to eastern Kentucky, and you've ever been in one of the deep shaft coal mines, and you've ever driven back in there for an hour or so and had them turn off the lights, you know what true darkness is. And you know that in that kind of darkness... Even the smallest glimmer of light brings a bright cast. It it, it is a stark contrast because in darkness, if it's complete and utter darkness, even a little bit of light makes a giant glare. And what John says is the opposite is also true. That if it's going to be genuine light, it can have no darkness in it whatsoever. That God is light, and in him there is absolutely no darkness. I think the image John wants us to see here is that God is a righteous God, and God has a standard that he has set for us, and anything outside of that standard is inviting in the darkness. So here's where John begins to get a little bit close to our own feelings. He says, if we say, verse 6, that we have fellowship with him, God, who is in the light, yet we walk in darkness, we are lying and we do not practice the truth. One of the ways John is pointing out here that we have a tendency to run from the light and run from God's help is that we want to claim a relationship with him and yet continue redefining terms. We want to act as though what we are doing is perfectly acceptable to God. Our lifestyle and our choices and our, the way we structure everything that we do, that's exactly the way God would have us to do, except John says... God is light, and in him there is no darkness. If we say we have fellowship with him, yet we walk, we continue in a path of darkness, we are actually lying to ourselves. I was talking with a friend of mine this week, and talking about Genesis chapter 3, and that that infamous moment when Adam and Eve were, were in the garden, and they were tempted by the serpent to take that fruit because the serpent said, God knows that when you take that fruit, you will become like him, knowing good and evil. And we were reflecting on the fact that that word know is is very significant. Because it's not just that you would know mentally something, but it's actually a determination. That in the garden, Adam and Eve decided they wanted to be the ones who defined God's terms for him. They wanted to be the ones who said, this is right and this is wrong. God, you've said this, but we would prefer to do this. And we all do the same thing. When we sin, as John says, we walk in the darkness because we're trying to go apart from God's standard, away from the light and into the darkness where we ourselves can be God. God or John says, fellowship in the light means that we must walk in the light. Now, it doesn't mean sinlessness. He even says here in verse 7 that if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from sin. So he's not saying you won't have sin. He's simply saying that if you are agreeing with God and you are walking in his light, that even your sins that you do commit will be cleansed by the blood of Jesus because you're not hiding from the light. You are walking in the light. So John begins here by talking about a universal standard of sin, but then he moves on to talk about a universal saturation of this sin. He goes into verse 8 and he says, If we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. 
So apparently there are teachers here that were leading some people astray in 1 John's context. Uh, there were some people who said that, you know what, we have risen above the point where we are sinning. We have gotten ourselves to a, such a high spiritual plane that we are no longer subject to these petty temptations and sins that you mere mortals are subject to. And John says, if you think that, you have totally missed what it means to understand the darkness and the light because the world has been saturated by this sin. And so this is a second way that we can tend to hide from the light. Not only do we try to redefine terms and, and minimize our sin, but we even go to the point of denying that what we are doing is sinful. He says again in verse 10, if, if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Notice that both of the consequences in both verse, verse 8 and verse 10 deal with truth claims. He says, if you say you're not in sin, you're deceiving yourself and the truth is not in you. And then in verse 10 he says, if we say we have not sinned, we make God out to be a liar. The fundamental nature of sin is that we want to make up our own reality and we want to create our own facts. As many politicians have said, you're entitled to your own opinion. You're not entitled to your own facts. John says God is a God of light. He's a God of word and truth. And our desire is to replace his word and his reality with our own ideas. So we either minimize what we're doing, we redefine what we're doing, or we just look at what we're doing and we say, there's no sin here. There's no story here. There's no problem with what I'm doing. God is totally fine with me. I don't think the danger that John is warning us here is a, is a sinless perfection because none of us will ever reach that unless we redefine our terms friend of mine says you tell me how they keep score and I'll tell you how to win the game the best way to win in this scenario is to change how the score is kept and that's what he's referring to here that we would say we are without sin but that's why verse 9 is so powerful and many of of you have mentioned to me I can't wait till we get to verse 9 because it's my favorite verse first John 1 9 so if we confess our sins he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We love this verse because it talks about how we can be forgiven, we can be cleansed, but, but I think we have to understand that it's more than just admitting that we are wrong. The, the idea here is the truth claim that God has spoken, we must agree with that. So the, the verb here, confess our sins, is not just like going into a, a closet and confessing to a guy in a white collar. The idea of confession here literally means to agree with God. That we would say, God, what you say is true is indeed true. What you say is right is indeed right, and what you say is wrong is indeed wrong. And not only are we agreeing with God about what is right and wrong, but we're agreeing we're on the wrong side of that. We have missed the mark. Now that's not something that we should try to hide and, and put into the darkness as though we are the only ones. John's saying that the power of the cross is that we can come into the light because in the light is the only place that sin can be cleansed. Now, this is particularly crucial for us in an age where morality is constantly shifting. We live in a cancel culture where day by day we are being informed and updated about what is the new morality. What was acceptable last year is no longer acceptable this year. This term or this phrase is something you used to be able to use, but now you can't use that term or that phrase anymore. This kind of ideology used to be acceptable, but now you can't use that ideology anymore. We're constantly being updated by the culture around us about morality and right and wrong. And if you're on the wrong side of that, you are canceled. But John says that's not where we find our true north. 
Our true north comes when we understand that God has his truth and we confess where we know his truth and where we have departed from it. And when we walk in that kind of light, he says he is faithful to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. There's a universal standard of sin. There's a universal saturation with sin. But then John closes this passage by pointing to a universal solution. Look in chapter 2. He says, My little children, I am writing you these things so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He himself is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for those of the whole world. So John closes out this passage by finishing a thought that he's been introducing. If you look back in verse 7, he talks about how the blood of Jesus purifies us from all sin. And then again in verse 9, he says that, the, uh, that he is faithful and just to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, he tells us how that cleansing happens. He says that cleansing happens because when we sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Now again, it's a when we sin, not if we sin scenario. John understands that those who are walking in the light, they still are not yet fully in the light. We are being transformed from one degree of glory to the next. So there is no such thing as a sinless, perfect believer in Jesus. We are simply being transformed to be more like him. And so John says, when we sin, we have an advocate with the Father. And this word advocate comes from a legal setting. You've heard of a lawyer, an attorney being referred to as an advocate. But it's not just the idea of a representative. Literally, the word means helper a comforter, one who can come alongside of you and be your help in time of need. And how is he our help? In verse 2, he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. In the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve were naked and unashamed. They were both fully known and fully loved. But when sin came into that setting, they hid. Because they realized that to be fully known is actually now shameful and is dirty and is guilty. So they hid. They're no longer fully known because they fear that they won't be fully loved. Have you ever noticed, though, that whenever you can create some semblance of a safe place people will begin to show themselves in their reality. I love the movie, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? I'm not recommending it to you, but uh, there are some quotes. If you're around me long enough, you'll hear me say. And there's a scene in that movie when the three men are, are there near a river and one of them gets baptized and he comes back saying, the preacher done forgive me of all my transgressions. He says, including that Piggly Wiggly I knocked over in Yazoo City. And one of the men says, oh, I thought you said you was innocent of them charges. And he says, well, I lied. And the preacher forgive me of that too. <laughs> it's a funny moment, but it illustrates a truth that we all have experienced, that when we feel there's forgiveness and we feel there is mercy, we feel there's a place where we can belong, We're willing to confess. We're willing to agree. We're willing to be real. In fact, I love the testimony time that we've been doing in the service because I think it's a time for us to model what it means to be real sinners who are in need of the grace of God. Now, sometimes I've I've been in some testimony scenarios where people shared a little bit too much, and we all thought, brother, I don't believe I'd have told that. Uh, But the reality is that Jesus creates a safe place where people can share, people can be who they are. And John says, if you are in Christ, you can have that freedom 
because Jesus has come to be our advocate and our atoning sacrifice. In other words, all of the guilt and all of the shame and all of the judgment that you might feel for what you have done has already been crucified. It's already been buried and it's already been raised from the dead. And just as it's a universal standard for sin and a universal saturation of sin, John goes on to say there is a universal solution. He says that he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins and not only our sins, but also for those of the whole world. That's why we as a church must have our arms and doors open to every man, woman, and child who walks the face of this earth. We must be the kinds of people who don't prejudge and predismiss people because of what we think they might have done or who, they, who we think they might be. We must be the kinds of people that John illustrates here, that we believe Jesus is the atoning sacrifice for our sins and also for anyone who will believe and follow Jesus. We are a community of sinners who are redeemed by the grace of God. And that's why we want to be reminding ourselves of that on a regular basis. Now, you've seen as you come in here, the tables are set for the Lord's Supper. It's going to look a little bit different this morning than we normally do. We have deacons out of town and COVID and everything, but we're going to do something a little bit different. We're going to have a time where we come to the Lord's table uh, with a physical response. And we're going to spend some time in reflection upon these truths and we're going to, when the song is playing, when you're ready to come to one of these tables and get the bread and get the cup, bring it back with you to your seat, and then we'll all take at the same time. Uh, that's how we're going to do it this morning. But the reason I want to do that is because this is who we are. And this is a perfect illustration of the passage that we're studying this morning, that we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, who is our atoning sacrifice. That has everything to do with the life of the church. That means that when we are here by the body and the blood of Jesus, there is not one of us that has a right to boast or to uh, hold something over another one of us. There's not one of us who has a closer standing to God or a standing that is further away from God. There's not one of us who has sinned too much or gone too far in the other direction to be welcome at this table. The only requirement is that we believe in the Lord Jesus and we give our lives to follow him. And when we do that, he says that when we sin, we have an advocate with the Father who is our atoning sacrifice. Problem is, many of us want to continue walking in the darkness and still want to be invited to this table. And this is where John would say we need to examine ourselves. And we need to be real with who we are. Because walking in the darkness is not about sinning. Every one of us is going to sin. Walking in the darkness is having this mindset that we get to define for ourselves what is right and what is wrong. We get to move around the terms and we get to minimize sin and deny sin and even say there is no sin here when God has said there is. And walking in darkness is denying the atonement and the advocacy of Jesus. If you're here this morning and you would say that you are in a, in a lifestyle, you are, you are making choices that are rejecting God's standards and you are rejecting God's plan for your life, this is a time for you to reflect on that and make a decision to turn and confess that to the Lord and repent and bow your knee to King Jesus. If you're here this morning and, and you're in a place where you would say that you, you, ha, you maybe think that you are without need of a Savior, you, you're walking in righteousness and there is no sin, this is a time for you to see the table and to be reminded a body had to be broken for you and blood had to be shed for you. This is how seriously God takes your sin. And it's a time for you to deal with that before the Lord. But for those of us who, who know we're in Christ and we know that we're, we're in good fellowship with him in our local church, this is a time for us to rejoice that even when we are in sinning, even when we are walking in our weakness, God is there to meet us and his light is faithful. I invite you to bow your heads and close your eyes. 
as we come to this time of the Lord's table. I like the idea of a physical response because this also gives opportunity for prayer. It gives an opportunity for decision as people are moving around to get the cup and the table. Um, if you'd like to come and talk with me about maybe something God is dealing with in your heart and your life, maybe God's called you to make a decision. Maybe he, he's called you to be baptized or to join the church. You can come and talk to me about that as well. It's also a time to be real. To be real with God. To confess your sins to Him. And to know that when you confess those sins that He is faithful and just to forgive you and to cleanse you. But it's also a time where we confess to one another. It's a time where we hold up this bread and we hold up this cup and we proclaim, I am a sinner who is in need of a body being broken. I am a sinner who is in need of blood being shed. I was hiding in the bush just like Adam and just like Eve because I was ashamed and I was guilty and I was afraid. But the good news of this table is that God has spoken into that reality and his light has shone into that reality and even in your guilt and in your shame and in your fear, God is calling you out. Adam, where are you? And in Jesus, because his body was broken and his blood was shed and he was laid in a garden tomb and because on the third day those eyes that were matted over in blood began to flicker open and that body that had been beaten and crushed by the blows of an enemy began to breathe with life again and those feet that had been nailed to the cross for your sins and for mine stepped off of that pedestal and out of that empty tomb door and because Jesus has raised from the dead, we no longer have to hide in the garden, but we can stand with him in his righteousness and be received as beloved sons and beloved daughters. As we come to this table, it's a time for us to celebrate that. As I've already mentioned, if you're here today and you're a Christian and you've been baptized and you're a member of your church, you don't have to be a member of this church, but... Uh, you're welcome to come to this table. If you're not yet a Christian or if God's dealing with you and you'd like to talk with someone and pray, we'll also be up here up during the time of, of response to do that. But don't leave here today before you make a decision and follow him in this confession that he is the light, the light who cleanses. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this table. Lord, we thank you that we can come to this table because not of anything that we have done, but Lord, because of your sacrifice that you sent your son Jesus, that his body was broken, his blood was shed so that we could be received as sons and daughters of God. Lord, we pray that as we come to this table that you would show us our need of a savior, that you would show us the seriousness of sin, that you have defined sin for us. Lord, that we would agree with you about that and we would surrender our lives to you. Lord, use this table to draw us closer to Jesus and make us more like him. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As your musicians come, you guys can spend some time before the Lord, and when you're ready, come to the table.
here we are, just a group of ragtag sinners and misfits and those who fall short of the glory of God, called out of darkness into his marvelous light. Because even as we confess our sins, we know we have an advocate and an atoning sacrifice who says, this bread is my body, which is broken for you. As often as you do this, you do it in remembrance of me. And Jesus says, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. As often as you do this, you do it in remembrance of me. And the Bible says, as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. And so let's stand together as the early apostles did, and let's close our time by singing a hymn uh, as we go out with a hymn, and then we'll have an announcement before before we're leaving. So let's sing the doxology together. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. do want to be dismissed with a benediction. Before we do that, though, just a quick announcement. Uh, we do have the offering box on your way out the door. Just remember that. And if you're a guest with us today, uh, we don't have any expectation for you to give, uh, as our members do, but you can just put your information on that card or the envelope and drop that in there. That can be your offering to us today. Also, if you're a member, don't forget to greet those that you may not have seen or, or may not know very well. Uh, don't just rush out of here, spend some time uh, just greeting one another, introduce someone, introduce yourself to someone you may not know. Uh, I do have a, a announcement that I just received that we have a birthday in the house. Uh, Missy Saffelder is her birthday is today. Happy birthday! <laughs> Happy birthday! We're, yeah, it's uh, I'm sure it's the 29th birthday, and we're just going to leave it at that. Uh, uh, but thank you for for being here, and praise God for your faithful service. And we also have a beautiful family that's come to uh, be presented as uh, candidates for membership. And so Chad Reagan. Uh, has come and he wants to just uh, ask for our affirmation that we would uh, receive him as a potential member here at First Baptist Gatlinburg. Can we, everyone in favor of that, uh, indicate that by a hearty amen. 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 And Chad and his little girl will be up here after the service. You want to uh, extend them the right hand of fellowship. Oh, that's right. The Huskies as well. Uh, Come on up. That's right. We just keep on responding. Keep on responding. That's great. We'll do do this all day, folks. That's great. (laughs) Praise the Lord. Amen. 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 (laughs) Uh, Tyler and Rachel and Will and Jack and Craig have been coming for quite some time and have indicated uh, just recently that they they want to take that next step and also be presented as candidates for membership here. So all in favor of that, give a hearty amen as well. Amen. Amen. They'll all be up here after the service uh, if you want to extend them a, a right hand of fellowship. But let me just dismiss us with the benediction from Philippians 4 that I pray my God will provide all of your needs abundantly in his grace in Christ Jesus. And may God, our Father, receive glory forever and ever. Amen. Go in his grace and go in his peace.